Well, Father God, this morning we recognize you as the God who tears down walls, as the God who breaks chains, as the God who sets people free. And so, Lord God, we pray today as we stand shoulder to shoulder as the people of God, we pray that the Spirit of God would come now and would minister to hearts. Lord, we pray that if there's anybody in this room that does not know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, we pray that this would be the day that they would bow their heart, bow their knee, their body and their spirit and all that they are before Jesus and receive the salvation that was bought by His blood on the cross. And Lord, we pray that if there's anybody in this room that is tormented by the demonic, Lord, that they would recognize that this is their day of freedom, that they can be free, that those chains can fall to the ground. Today, Lord, we pray that they would be set free. And Lord, we pray those that are sick, those that are hurting, those that are bruised in body, Lord God, we pray that you would set them free today. We pray that you would heal them, take away their pain. And Lord, we also pray for those that have been through trying things, troubling things. And Lord, they're experiencing a different kind of pain. There's a heaviness there. There's a woundedness there. And Father, we pray that you'd come and put your hand upon those places. And you'd, you'd heal those hearts that are grieving, that are wounded. And Lord God, we just pray for wholeness, wholeness, wholeness in this room for every person that stands here before you. And Lord God, we just thank you for all of the victories you've given us. We thank you, God, for all of the good things. We thank you for our salvation. Many of us, for many, many years ago, you opened our eyes to see Jesus. And Lord God, we thank you that we have this great and high privilege of being able to come together into this place and gather around your word and the Holy Spirit would open up these pages to us and speak to us and teach us and change our hearts. Lord God, we thank you for this moment of time that you've given us in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Give them a great big clap. Yeah. Glory to your name, Lord. Bless your name. Bless your name. Go ahead and take a seat. Uh, those of you that don't know, um, we have a special section over here with no seats, and you might have been wondering what that is. We've had a few showers of blessings come in the side of the, of the roof, and there's a little bit of a, a hole there, and we wanted to make sure that you uh, didn't have anything fall on you or that you didn't get a shower that you didn't need. So, so we're just looking out for you today. Hopefully within the next week or so, that is going to be repaired. We've got our best minds on it. And so you know that will take no time at all to get that done. And so we're happy about that and excited about it. And um, what else did I want to say? Oh, yeah, I just wanted to say thank you for everybody that was involved with Fall Fest. You know, it, it, was, it was a beautiful day out there together. It was wonderful food, and it was just a great, great time. Thank you for the setup. Thank you for the cleanup and all those things that were involved. It was just a, a wonderful thing. And also thanks to John Graff for preaching uh, last week. Did you enjoy that message last week? <laughs> Always appreciate it when I, when I have the ability to call John, and he's such a faithful guy, and he agrees about 98.5% of the time to <laughs> preach, and so I appreciate that very, very much. And then also, as probably most of you know, Jennifer and I got an opportunity to, to go to a cabin in Brown County and uh, spend several days there. And so we had a wonderful time out in the woods, out in the middle of nowhere. Believe me, it was out in the middle of nowhere. And uh, I kept thinking, are we going to go off the edge of the earth? If I, was a flat, <laughs> if I was a flat earther, I would think I might be getting to the end of the earth here. But, but it was a great, great, wonderful time out there, made of fire, beautiful uh, cabin. And uh, one of the first things that happened was we got there in the, in, at nighttime in the evening. We came in the door. One of the first things that happened is a, a big wolf spider came right inside the door. <laughs> and so you know how I like those wolf spiders very much, so it made my day. And so we just had a, we had a wonderful time. And thank you for everybody that had a part in uh, sending us to that. We appreciate all of your uh, encouragement, your, your cards, your letters, your words of encouragement. We appreciate you so very, very much. Uh, 
it's, it's amazing. I, th I think that we're going to be starting, I think, on our 14th year here. And it just, wow. seems, it just seems like a few years, you know. And uh, that's because I blocked out some. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> but, but, it, but 14 years, it's, it's hard to imagine. Um, other churches that I've pastored, I was there for four years, five years, six years, but going on 14 here. And so we counted a great, great blessing of being a part of your family and a part of this community. Now this morning I want to speak to you as we continue on in our series about plundering the kingdom of darkness. I'm going to bring a message to you this morning that is entitled That Old Black Magic. And it is interesting that today we are worshiping together on Halloween. How often does that happen? I think it's fitting. I think it should be. But uh, that is a strange happening. And so this morning, the message is that old black magic. And so as we begin here, let me just ask you a question. Let me start with a question. The question is this. What is witchcraft? What is witchcraft? You know, so often, we talked about this at our men's breakfast yesterday, so often we have words in our, in our English vocabulary that we think we know what they mean, but, but oftentimes we're not really totally sure about the definition. And so what do we mean when we say witchcraft? Do we envision old women on broomsticks riding against the silhouette of the moon? Or maybe in front of a cauldron that is boiling and dropping uh, toads in and the eye of newt, whatever that is. And, and, and is that witchcraft, you know, casting spells and those sorts of things. I did find something interesting yesterday. I've heard on the television that the number one most popular costume in 2021 for Halloween is a witch. Now, now I find that interesting. I find that strange that the, that the most popular costume is a witch. So what is witchcraft? Now, if you go to Webster, Webster says, witchcraft is rituals and practices that incorporate belief in magic and that are associated especially with neo-pagan traditions and religions such as Wicca. But when we think of witchcraft, the Bible speaks to us about this topic. In Deuteronomy 18.10, listen to what it says. It says, Let no one be found among you who sacrifices his son or daughter in the fire, who practices divination or sorcery, or interprets omens, or engages in witchcraft. Verse 11 goes on and it says, Or casts spells, or is a medium, or a spiritist, or one who consults the dead. Anyone who does these things is detestable to the Lord. And because of these detestable practices, the Lord your God will drive out those nations before you. As we look through the Scripture, what we understand about God's concept of witchcraft, we might associate it with witches and, and sorcerers and, and the demonic and, and these sorts of things, but, but God, His definition of witchcraft is simply this, that any source of power that you try to use to bring about your will in spite of His will is in the category of witchcraft. Anytime you reject the will of God and seek to impose your will, it is in the area of witchcraft. When we read this passage, it included things like human sacrifice and divination and the casting of spells and the consulting of the dead. And all of these together have one purpose. It is to bypass the will of God, to not seek God for His will and His wisdom and His understanding, to bypass those things and contact some other supernatural source and power for the distinct purpose of bringing about not God's will, but bringing about my will. This is witchcraft. It's the use of the supernatural to fulfill my selfish desires. 
Moses tells the children of Israel before they go into the promised land, also in Deuteronomy 18, he says this, he says, the nations you will dispossess, listen to those who practice sorcery or divination. But as for you, the Lord your God has not permitted you to do so. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your own brothers, and you must listen to him. Do you understand the, the connection? Do you understand the relationship? Don't seek the wisdom of darkness. Don't seek to, to bring your will about through other means, but you must seek the will of God. And Moses particularly was talking about the coming of Jesus as another prophet coming after Moses, who in fact would be Messiah. And he says, listen to him. Moses is saying to them, don't trust these other sources, but only God who will lead you and cause you to walk on the path that lines up with His will. With that understanding of answering the question about what is witchcraft, we come to the story of Simon the sorcerer and our message this morning, that old black magic. In chapter 8, as we began to study this a couple of weeks ago, we saw that Stephen had been martyred. The people had scattered from Jerusalem under great persecution. And Philip goes down to Samaria. And in Samaria, he preaches the gospel of Christ there. And many come to forgiveness, having their sins completely healed and forgiven, washed away. Their bodies are set free from sickness. He cast out the screaming demons of Samaria. And the Bible says that there was great, great joy in that city. In other words, the kingdom of God moved into that place and plundered the kingdom of darkness and established the kingdom of God there in Samaria. In verse 9, we see now an all too familiar pattern as we have been going through this book of Acts, we have seen this over and over again, and we will continue to see it over and over again, this familiar pattern of the church moving forward and having great victory and people set free and the church growing. And then Satan stands up to oppose, to resist, to try to stop. And that's exactly what is happening here when we come to Acts chapter 8, verse number 9. Here's what it says. Now for some time, a man named Simon had practiced sorcery in the city and amazed all the people of Samaria. He boasted, he boasted that he was someone great. And all the people, both high and low, gave him their attention and exclaimed, this man is the divine power known as the great power. They followed him because he had amazed them for a long time with his magic. But when they believed Philip, when they believed his preaching about Jesus, as he preached the good news of the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Look at verse number 13. And Simon himself believed and was baptized. And he followed Philip everywhere, astonished by the great signs and miracles that he saw. Now, if we were to just look at this passage and we were to just take this at face value, we might look at this and say, this is wonderful. This guy that had been involved in dark magic and dark powers and the occult and sorcery has now come to Jesus. I mean, the Bible says he believed. And so isn't this wonderful? And, and, and we would just be rejoicing that this guy, this guy who was a sorcerer, now got saved and wants to be a part of the church and even wants to be a part of the ministry of the church. But what was really happening here? What was really happening was that Satan had seen the advancement of the church, the movement of the church, the joy that had come throughout Samaria from people being set free, and he had to do something to try to trip up the church, to try to stop the church. What was happening here was Satan was trying to infect the church through Simon. 
in verses 14 through 17, it says that Samaria had believed, but not yet received the Holy Spirit. Now, what was happening here? This is kind of the backdrop, and, and we're going to kind of, you know, play off of this and, and what's happening with Simon. What is happening there in Samaria? Well, Samaria, remember a few weeks ago, we taught that they were an outcast from the Jews. They were thought as a mixed breed, and so the Jews didn't want to have anything to do with them. And so now the church has, has come to life in Samaria, and there's a church in Jerusalem. And God does not want a division between the church in Jerusalem and the church in Samaria. And so He decides in His own heart that what He will do is He will not give them the Holy Spirit. They will not be filled with the Holy Spirit and speak in tongues as they had done in Jerusalem until the apostles come from Jerusalem, lay hands, and make a connection between the Jerusalem church and the Samaritan church, and they all come together as one church. And so that is what God is doing here. God does not want that same division. So he has Peter and John come, lay hands upon them. They begin to be filled with the Holy Spirit. They're speaking in tongues. They're, they're praising God. The churches are united, and it's a wonderful, wonderful thing. But that's not what Simon sees. Simon sees an opportunity. He was amazed by what he saw. These guys came, laid hands upon people. They were filled with the Holy Spirit, began to speak in tongues. There were miracles going on. It was just amazing. Simon sees an opportunity. The Bible tells us that for many, many years he had enjoyed his influence through sorcery, through magic, through amazing the people. And he thinks to himself, I could continue to control these people, but just with a Christian spin. His heart had not changed. He had said that he believed in Jesus, but his heart had not changed. In Acts chapter 8, verse number 17, here's what it says. Then Peter and John placed their hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. In verse 18, and when Simon saw that the Spirit was given at the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money and said, Give me also this ability so that everyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. And Peter answered in this way. Kind of rough answering a new convert like this, but he wasn't a new convert. Peter answered, May your money perish with you because you thought you could buy the gift of God with your money. You see, as we said in the beginning, witchcraft and sorcery is about manipulating people and manipulating situations in order to bring your will about. And things had not changed in the heart of Simon. This is what he still wanted. He just saw a new power, a new way, a new angle to continue doing what he had been doing before, controlling the people. And Satan wanted to use him, place him inside the church, even make him a minister inside the church to inject something very poisonous inside when we look at Simon's history, we see in verse number 9 that he had practiced sorcery and he had amazed the people for a long time. And he boasted that he was somebody great. In verse number 10, it says, All the people gave him their attention and said that this man was a divine power. In verse number 11, it says, They followed him because he had amazed them with magic for a long time. This man, Simon, had been used by Satan to control and captivate the people of Samaria there. And Satan wanted that con to continue, and Simon wanted the control to continue as well. Many churches today would see this situation, and they would immediately have Simon testify at the next church service. That's exactly what would happen. They would say, what an incredible testimony. We've seen it for years, haven't we? The average person on the street who bows their heart before Christ and is radically saved will never be brought up in front of the church to tell their amazing story. 
But the guy that was a warlock, the guy that was a sorcerer, the guy that was the deepest, darkest sinner, all he has to do is say, I believe in Jesus, and all of a sudden we put him up in front of the church. And that's exactly what most churches would have done with this guy Simon. He would have been on TBN. He would have been invited to all the churches. But Simon cared nothing about Jesus. He was only impressed by the power of Jesus. Say, again, Satan was using him to infect the church. But Peter stood between Simon and the church through a discernment of what was happening on the inside of Simon. Through a gift of the Holy Spirit, the discerning of spirits, Peter was able to see into the heart and spirit of Simon and able to understand the motivation. He looked okay from the outside, but God showed him what was happening on the inside. He recognized, Peter recognized Simon's motive. Verse 21 says, you have no part or share in this ministry because your heart is not right before God. Repent of this wickedness and pray to the Lord and perhaps He will forgive you for having such a thought in your heart. And listen to what verse 23 says. For I see, for I see that you are full of bitterness and captive to sin. Here is that gift of the Holy Spirit opening up Peter's eyes to see into Simon's heart. And he says, I see that you are full of bitterness and captive to sin. Peter says, number one, your heart is not right. You're not humbled. You're not repentant. Your motive is not to serve God out of gratitude that Jesus paid for your sin. Your motive is to have the power that would give you the control that you've enjoyed so long over the people. Your motive is selfish gain. Your heart isn't right, Peter says to him. Peter says, you're full of bitterness. The King James says, you're, you're in the gall of bitterness. And, and the word picture that is being painted here is a picture of a plant, a root that is springing up out of the ground, but is poisonous and bitter. And if it's allowed to grow, there will be many that will come by and be poisoned from that thing. And so Peter's saying, I see this in you. I see this, this root of bitterness, and I will not allow it to grow inside the church. Hebrews 12 touches on this idea where it says, see to it that no one misses the grace of God and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. Peter says, I see it growing in you, and it is not coming into the church. I, Peter says, I cannot embrace your desire to be a part of ministry. I won't let it happen. Peter goes on to say, you're captive to sin. You're still captive to sin. You may have said that you believed, but sin still has you captive. It's not just a matter that Simon was a sinner like all of us are sinners. But sin still had him bound. It still had him captive. Therefore, it meant that Satan was still his master. Simon, you're still in chains. In other words, Peter was saying to Simon that nothing has really changed here. And what Satan was trying to do was trying to insert into the church through Simon a deadly poison. You see, Satan was playing on a human weakness that every single one of us in this room have. Simon had it. All the people of Samaria had it. All the people in Jerusalem have it. And all the people in this room, to some degree, including me, we also have it. That thing that Satan knew was our weakness and he was trying to insert into the church through Simon is simply this. The need 
to control what happens next. Some of us are worse than others. Some of us have been called control freaks. Have you ever been called a control freak? You only feel good when you have arranged everything in such a way that you know exactly how it's going to come out and you are in control. Now, there's a certain part of that that's just a part of human nature and it's not necessarily rebellious to God. But when we're talking about in the area that, that Simon is touching on here, this is an evil and a wicked thing. Because what it amounts to is this. It, amount, it amounts to a teaching that says, it doesn't matter what God's will is. I am going to do everything at my disposal to bring about my will. And that's the only thing that is important. You see, because as we go back to the beginning of this teaching, this is the essence of witchcraft. An attempt to manipulate people and manipulate situations so that I get my outcome. I get what I want. Even if it's wrong, even if it's against God's will, I will have what I want because it's what I need and I will do whatever it takes to get it. And all of us in this room would say, I'd never be like that. I won't say any more about that. I think you know the truth. <laughs> it's an attitude that says, I will have my will done. I must be and control. And oftentimes we as Christians, you know, we'll, we'll throw something in it like, God understands my heart. Yes, He does. He understands it's desperately wicked. That's what He understands. But the essence of following Jesus is not that I do everything in my power to control people and control the situations around me. That's not the essence of following Jesus. The essence of following Jesus is the exact opposite. The following of Jesus is the giving up of my control to control people, to control situations, to even control God. I give up my control. Instead of demanding, I now come into a place of submission and obedience where what I seek to achieve is not for my own selfish glory because I want it or I need it, but what I seek to achieve is because the Holy Spirit has driven me to a certain direction, a point, has given me a mandate, has told me what to do, and therefore I will do everything in my power to bring about God's will. But when I do everything in my power to bring about my will, it amounts to witchcraft. Simon liked being in control. He had taught the people for many, many years that, that he could show them also how to be in control of other people in situations through magic and through sorcery. He could manipulate everything to make everything go their way. And now Simon saw the miracles and he saw the apostles laying on hands and the Holy Spirit coming and, and this manifestation of power he recognized the power of God. He was impressed with the power of God, but he wanted nothing to do with submitting his life to Jesus. He just wanted that power. He immediately sees an opportunity. An opportunity to use that power. He says, people will come to me. They'll be even willing to pay me. I'm going to make piles of money. I can still have people following me. I'll just put some Christian terminology on it, and my name is going to be as big as it's ever been. I'm going to have new cards printed up. It's going to be great. But God stopped him, as I said, through Peter. Satan was stopped. And the church rolled on. So what are the applications as we look at this passage? What are the applications for us today? As we look through the book of Acts, I think we would all agree that the book of Acts shows us the forward motion of the church. The whole premise of this series is it shows us the places 
where the kingdom of God is plummeting the kingdom of darkness. We would all agree that we're watching that happen as we go through those chapters in the book of Acts. But the other thing that it shows us, it shows us the power of the Holy Spirit setting people free. But it also shows us, as I've said many times now, Satan rising up, and it shows us the schemes that he uses to come against the church and to come against individuals. And I believe that as God gave us this book that we call Acts, I believe he wants us to be inspired by the power of God being poured out. He wants us to be inspired by watching the growth of the church go forward, but he also wants us to be instructed and warned as he shows us all the ways that this snake tries to come and infiltrate the church and infiltrate our lives and tries to stop us from the great commission that Christ has given us. And so we can watch this happening in these pages and it equips us to understand how Satan might be trying to get into our life maybe showing us some of the doors that might be open in our life so that we can shut them and not allow the enemy to come in and take a hold of us and stop what God has ordained that our life should be able to accomplish. Acts 8 shows us the weakness of Simon, a desire to control what happens next, irregardless of what God says. It also shows us our weakness. That to a certain degree, every single one of us have that lurking on the inside of us. And it warns us to be careful to shut the door on Satan. Peter stopped Simon's poison, but it got in somewhere. Because many large churches today are built on this doctrine. That Christianity is a way to manipulate life so you can get what you want. And we all know that is true. All we have to do is turn on the television. And we see that that is being taught far and wide across the land. It's almost like, nobody would admit this, but it's almost like the motto of some churches is, my will be done. And in essence, they have taken the following of Christ and they have turned it in to Christian witchcraft. The essence of our walk with Christ is not that I get my will, but that I surrender my will to His. Everybody say amen. amen. Jesus taught us this lesson when He went into the wilderness and He was tempted by Satan. You remember that? He was out there. He fasted. He got hungry. Satan comes to Him and tempts Him. He says, Jesus, turn the stones into bread. You know, you are hungry. You decide when it's time to eat. Jesus would not impose his will upon that situation. He stayed submitted to the Father. Satan says, throw yourself down out of this pinnacle because the Bible says that God will protect you. His angels will lift you up lest you dash your foot against a stone. And so prove who you are, Jesus. If you really are the Son of God, of all people, the Father will protect you if you throw yourself off of this pinnacle. But Jesus had nothing to prove to Satan. Satan was trying to provoke him for Jesus to get stirred up in his will instead of being submitted to the Father, for Jesus to get stirred up in his will and say, I'll show you who I am. But Jesus had nothing to do with that. Satan came to him and says, bow down to me, and I'll give you all the kingdoms of the world. It'll be easy. Satan was saying to Jesus, the Father has a will for you, 
but what is your will? Wouldn't it be easier just to bow down to me and I'll give you all the kingdoms of the world? But Jesus would have none of it. Because all of these temptations were about trying to get Jesus to come out from being submitted to the Father and exercising His own will, what He wanted. He wouldn't do it. The culmination of it, of course, was in the Garden of Gethsemane, where He's praying before God and sweats, blood drops out as sweat. And He's saying, Father, if there be any other will, or any other way, and then he comes to that place which I think was just as important as what happened on the cross. Because when Jesus came to that place where he said, not my will, but yours be done, Father. The door was shut on Satan. And as he went to the cross and shed his blood for the sins of the world, the deal was sealed. But in the garden, He closed the door. He taught us that the number one thing that God is looking for is for our heart to be surrendered to Him and completely His. And the evidence of that is that we would say, not my will, but Your will. In the Old Testament, there is the story of the first king of Israel, Saul. Saul was a messed up dude, man. He was just a messed up dude. He continually chose to raise his will above God's will. You know the story. Samuel was the prophet, and over and over again, Samuel's coming to him. He's pulling out his hair saying, Saul. Why won't you just do what God wants you to do? And Saul, over and over again, was like, I got a better idea guy. He was the better idea guy. Yeah, that, that, that sounds good. That could work. But, but I think if I did it this way, I think it would be even better. And so Samuel tried to help him. He tried to teach him. But Saul just continually, constantly was disobedient to God. Finally, Samuel dies Saul's in trouble. God won't talk to him. So Saul does what he knows is absolutely forbidden in the Word of God. He seeks out the witch at Endor in hopes of contacting the dead Samuel. Couldn't be more wrong. Right to the end, Saul elevated his will above God's will. Before Samuel died, he try, he's trying to teach Saul. He's trying to teach him. He's trying to help him to understand that if you could just submit yourself to the will of God, if you could just be obedient to God, submit your heart to the will of God, it would be a wonderful experience. Saul never got it, but this is what, this is what Samuel taught him. He says this in 1 Samuel verse, or chapter 15, verse 23. He says, For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. In other words, rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. What is he saying? Rebellion is putting your will above God's will. And this, in essence is witchcraft, trying to manipulate people, trying to manipulate situations to bring your will to bear and with no regard for God's will. We manipulate things to get our will no matter what God says because it's what we want and it's what we need. Samuel's trying to tell Saul, this thing that you got going on where you just refuse to listen to the will of God is the same thing as witchcraft. He goes on, he says, the stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. And the meaning here is simply this, that the proof of our worship, the proof of the sincerity of our worship 
is not how well we sing. The proof of the sincerity of our worship is whether or not we are obedient to God. Everybody say amen. amen. Real and true worship is whether or not our heart is submitted to God and up out of that heart through the Holy Spirit flows life and goodness and good choices and a life lived well. But it starts with being submitted to Almighty God. The message, if I could take the message of Simon the Sorcerer and I could distill it down into one little ball, it would simply be this that Satan will attack the area of your life where your will is not submitted to God. He's not going to attack that area where it's strong and fortified. He's going to attack that area where it's weak and where that will is not submitted to God. And so the lesson this morning is simply this. That God is calling us to recognize from the pages of the book of Acts that the enemy of our souls will come against us just like he came against these people in the first century. And he doesn't have any new ideas. He's going to do the same thing over and over and over again. And we've got to recognize that there are places in our life that are not submitted to God. And those are the very places that the enemy will attack. And so the Holy Spirit calls us this morning to identify those places and to submit them to God. Close the door and not be the window or the door that the enemy is able to get in through. Especially important as we enter into these last days, for many, many, many years now, the church has been able to kind of bebop along and get by. But we are entering into a season where our walk with Christ now is going to become deathly serious. And every believer has got to understand how serious a walk we are called to now. Would you stand? Worship team, come on back. Church, we're going to continue to worship. And as we worship this morning, we want to give opportunity to you in this particular way. Sometimes people, I don't want to say innocently because it's not innocent, but sometimes people, even Christians, they dabble a little bit in this and they dabble a little bit in that. And maybe it's something as simple as the horoscope. Maybe it's a Ouija board. Maybe it's a little pornography on the computer or the phone or the iPad. Whatever it is, it's something we've dabbled in a little bit. And for a lot of people, they can get by. They can do a little this and they can do a little that. doesn't seem to affect their life very much. They feel bad about it. They repent of it and they go on. But for some people, They've opened up that door a little bit and they have noticed that there's been an attachment. They have noticed that something has begun to happen from that time. That there is a sin that plagues them over and over again. They just can't seem to get free of it. And sometimes what we need is somebody to come alongside of us and pray. Just as we've seen in the book of Acts, there's sometimes a need for somebody to have somebody come and pray that that demonic attachment would be cut loose and cast off. And there's no embarrassment in this church. No embarrassment. Because every single one of us struggle with something. Every single one of us struggle with something. 
This morning, you don't have to tell anybody what you're struggling with. But you may want to at least raise up your hand in just a second and say, I am struggling with something. And I do need to have some people come and pray for me because I'm sick of it. And I want to get free of it. I don't want to live like this anymore. I don't want to be tormented in my mind with guilt. I don't want to have any chains or any shackles on me whatsoever. I want to be free.